Today's video is on the seed oils you should never ever eat, but also some seed oils that are okay to have from time to time. And in order to understand this sort of hierarchy of worst to best, we also need to understand what the actual problem is because there is a ton of confusion out there. With seed oils, we used to think, and if you had to ask me five or six years ago, it's what I probably would have thought, that they were high omega-6 and that made them very inflammatory. That's not so much the case anymore, okay? There was even a randomized controlled study that took a look at 15 different papers and found that when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it, it's not the omega-6 oil itself that's the problem. In fact, there doesn't seem to really be a link with changes in prostaglandins and changes in these inflammatory markers with seed oils. The problem comes from the processing, comes from the rancidity, comes from the solvents, and a number of other things. So that's what we're really going to look at. I'm not as concerned about the quote unquote inflammatory issue of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. We used to really tout that as the holy grail issue, but now we're seeing when we get down to it, a lot of these seed oils in their natural form are probably not a problem. It's the fact that they're so adulterated. So that's what we have to look at, which seed oils are worst and which ones are okay. Very important thing to note that when we consume seed oils, because they are a polyunsaturated fat, they are naturally very unstable, but they also naturally incorporate into our cells. So they absorb into our cell membrane. This is not a problem if it's a fresh, clean seed oil, but show me a restaurant that is using a fresh, clean, seed oil or show me a processed food that has a fresh clean seed oil you see where i'm getting with this so it's the rancidity that creates this stress within our body and then we're incorporating a basically a rancid oil that's incorporating directly into our cells that's the problem not the inherent nature of the seed oil itself also the solvents things like hexane okay hexane is a chemical that is used in glue, it's used in cleaning solvents, it's used in like literally making inks and varnishes. It's not good stuff. And the other thing we have to look at is some of these seed oils in copious amounts do have naturally occurring trans fats. And when you start having copious, concentrated amounts of this, these trans fats can pose a problem with visceral fat, metabolic health, et cetera. So the first one that you need to avoid at all costs, this is one that I just recommend just getting out of your life, is going to be corn oil. You thought I was gonna say soybean oil, but here's the issue with corn oil. Corn oil by its very nature is probably not that bad in a small amount, but you're not getting a lot of oil from corn in its natural form. It's when it's hyper-processed. So corn uses a huge, huge, huge amount of hexane and deodorants to ultimately make it an oil. So this means that through this process, it's become very, very unstable. Okay, so already you have a lot of chemicals, but then you've processed it so much that it's barely even an oil anymore. So it becomes rancid very, very easy. And corn oil is usually used for like, well, frying tortillas into tortilla chips or corn tortillas and uh, tor uh, tortilla chips, right? So we have all this stuff where it's high heat and it's used over and over again. Now, if we are paying attention to the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, it has an astounding 46 to one omega-6 to omega-3. So even in the world where omega-6s don't cause inflammation, this is a ridiculously unnatural ratio. And lastly, no matter what your opinion of the World Health Organization, they have even classified glyphosates, like in GMO corn, as a possible carcinogen. So even though we kind of brush it under the rug in the United States, I do think that it's a little bit of a cause for concern and maybe we should limit the amount of GMO corn oil we're getting into our bodies. Most companies, if they're going to use quote unquote organic corn oil, wouldn't be using corn oil in the first place. They're using corn oil because it's cheap. The next one that you wanna avoid, but with some caveats, is going to be soybean oil. You knew it was gonna be high on the list, but what's going on with this? Well, it's very particular because organic soybean oil in its truly natural organic form, which is a very like rare instance, at least in the United States, it's not a terrible oil, it has a decent smoke point. I mean, it's not something you wanna be guzzling, but it's really not that bad. But most of the soybean oil that we're consuming has gone through a process of what's called interestification. This is where they change the actual fats in the oil itself and actually can increase the trans fat content of the soybean oil, even if it's not hydrogenated. Now, what this means is that if you're looking at a label and it says soybean oil, and it's not organic soybean oil, it probably has a decent amount of trans fats and it's probably a very unstable oil. 
So if you're going to have something with soybean oil, I highly recommend limiting it, but at least opt for something that has organic soybean oil. There's a study published in Nutritional Biochemistry that took a look at interestified soybean oil, regular soybean oil, and lard, and it found that the interestified soybean oil ended up increasing body weight in mice, ended up increasing adipose tissue, ended up increasing uh, overall fasting glucose, and it also increased the liver stress markers. So there's some serious issues going on there that might be beyond what we even know with science. It's just best to limit it. The next one is one that you really should limit and probably not have more than one time per week. It is easier to avoid if you start paying attention to it. More and more brands are moving away from it. And that's gonna be canola oil. Now the issue with canola oil is the massive deodorization that has to occur. So when you're looking at canola oil and rapeseed oil, very, very toxic oils. And they're also very stinky and they're very nasty and they have to go through a lot of chemical deodorization processes. This increases the trans fat content significantly through the distillation in and of itself. But then we also have to look at the chemicals that are there that we're consuming. But then there was a study in the Journal of the American Oil Chemist Society that took a look at canola oil and they deodorized it for various lengths of time and various temperatures. They found the hotter and the longer it was deodorized, the higher the trans fat content, higher trans fat linolenic and higher trans fat linoleic. What does this mean to you as a consumer or as someone that's just consuming this? It means that in an effort to try to make an oil more stable, they've affected your health, okay? Trans fats are something that I think everyone agrees on. Trans fats are not good. Links to visceral fat, links to metabolic issues, links to inflammation, links to disease. Trans fats are not good. That's why they're generally listed on a label. So when you're modifying an oil to the point where it's so modified, it has literal trans fats in it, it doesn't make sense. So what do you wanna look for? Well, if you go to Whole Foods, a lot of times you will see they have expressed or expeller pressed, excuse me, canola oil. This means that they've taken it and they've squeezed the oil out of it versus heating it and deodorizing it. That makes it significantly better. Is it an oil that you wanna consume? Is it gonna affect your satiety, your hunger? Possibly. What we do have to look at here is some observational research. There was an observational study that found that subjects, generally speaking, that consume higher amounts of canola oil ended up having higher body weight, higher BMI, and higher body fat. Okay, there's a number of different reasons that could be the case, that's purely observational. But when you start looking at rodent model stuff, you see the mechanisms and you see, okay, well, there's something going on here with the rancidity. Usually it's heated so much that when it's heated, it makes it so rancid that it's essentially a toxic oil. So it's not about, again, a seed oil. Like if you have a handful of sunflower seeds, that's not bad. What we're talking about is these highly processed, highly chemically adulterated oils. Now let's get into the fun stuff, the stuff that you can have occasionally. Now before I get into these, I popped the link down below for 25% off of Thrive Market. The cool thing about Thrive Market is even though they have products that have seed oils in them, you will find that they're typically like avocado oil or they're gonna be expeller pressed oils or they're gonna be various forms of expeller pressed sunflower oil. They keep a watchful eye on that stuff. You're not gonna find the garbage there. But the bottom line is, if you do grocery shopping like any ordinary human, then it's a place for you to get a very, very good price on all of your groceries. Not to mention using that link down below saves you 25% off your entire first grocery order. Okay, plus you can shop by different diet category. So again, you do what you wanna do by all means. There's no pressure. They're a big sponsor on this channel. They allow for this content to be created so that I can do what I do. So of course I appreciate your support, but you have to do what's right for you. The bottom line, this is a very cost-effective way to get good quality ingredients into your home. You can already have them stuff vetted out because Thrive Market doesn't put garbage on their shelves. So check them out down below. Again, 25% off your entire order and a free $50 gift when you use that link in the top line of the description right underneath this video. Okay, something that I think is okay to have like one time per week, again, with a little bit of nuance, okay, is going to be palm oil. Now palm oil is interesting because palm oil is predominantly saturated fat, some monounsaturated and some polyunsaturated. So technically when it's refined palm oil, it's coming from the seed, okay, from a palm kernel. Okay, and from there they refine it with solvents and everything. It's just as bad as these other, other oils. But when you have unrefined palm oil, that's directly squeezed from the plant. Usually expensive and it's still a plant form of saturated fat. Okay. 
There's some interesting evidence out there that suggests that maybe plant forms of saturated fat aren't as good as maybe like a naturally occurring animal source of saturated fat. The jury is still out on that, but the bottom line is that most of the palm oil that's in processed food is going to be refined. There are very few products that are using unrefined palm oil. That being said, because of its saturated fat content, it does have a very high smoke point. So if you're maybe watching the kinds of fat that you consume, it probably is halfway decent to cook with. Now let's move into something that you're gonna see more regularly. Safflower oil and sunflower oil. Now people ask, what's the difference between the two? Sunflower oil usually has a little bit more omega-6 than safflower, but they're almost used interchangeably. So if you look on a label, a lot of times you'll see uh, on the ingredient list, safflower oil slash or and or sunflower oil. It's because they can legally be used interchangeably. So for all intents and purposes, we'll consider them sort of the same thing here. The good thing about these oils is that they have a very high smoke point, okay, 510 degrees, which means when it comes to being exposed to high heat, they don't become rancid until they're at a higher temperature. But there's still a good number of solvents that are used with a lot of these. So again, you wanna look for expeller pressed. Expeller pressed safflower, expeller pressed sunflower. I do think the amount that these oils are used is not as much as say canola or soybean. So that's why I say you're granted a little bit of slack maybe having these a few times per week because you're gonna find them in just about everything these days. There's also some interesting evidence that there's been positive correlations with moderate amounts of safflower and sunflower oil on blood glucose positive impacts on inflammation. This is in moderate amounts. So if you were to go and grab a handful of sunflower seeds, I wouldn't say you have a problem. But if you had a handful or a cup of the oil, that might be a problem, right? Like how many, how much oil can you get if you were naturally consuming these seeds? Okay, that's what you have to think about here. So let's move into another one that I think is very, very interesting that we don't see nearly as much of, but that's gonna be sesame oil. Sesame oil, I think is perfectly fine to have three, maybe even four times per week but there's a huge caveat. Sesame oil is not something you typically wanna cook with. Okay, now the benefits of sesame oil typically only happen when it's toasted sesame oil. So is it a seed oil? Yes, it literally is. But when you toast sesame oil, it activates a potent antioxidant in the sesame oil that literally protects it from oxidation. So what you've learned through all this is that it's the rancidity and the badness of these oils that when they're sitting around for a long time. When you toast sesame oil, it creates its own sort of like almost force field around it that makes it higher, resi more resilient. Let's just put it that way. So when you consume it, you're having less likelihood of it incorporating into cell membranes with just a messed up rancidity and just being out of whack, right? So it can be a very stable oil, not the highest smoke point, because remember, once it's been toasted, it actually lowers the smoke point. So this is an oil you wanna use as a drizzling oil. Now there's actually positive benefits. Like if you look at the research, small amounts of sesame oil used when drizzled can lower HbA1c, can improve fasting glucose, can lower inflammation, and can improve weight. So I've talked about sesame oil as like a beneficial oil, even though it's a seed oil for a number of years. Okay, so I think it's okay a few times per week. That's the kind of oil, like olive oil, sesame oil, macadamia nut oil, these kinds of oils I like to drizzle on salads. They're the ones that I would put on top of something to add these fats in, not to cook with. Which leads me to another very important one. Okay, this is one that you can consume again if you're drizzling with it, and that's gonna be flax seed oil. And I know I'll catch some stuff from some people on this because flax considered uh, estrogenic in some camps. The thing is, is that you have to look at, if you look at the research, especially some of the research with like breast cancer and men and stuff like that where estrogen really plays a role, they actually find that flax, being the phytoestrogens in flax are pretty potent, they bind to the estrogen receptors and actually prevent the more potent toxic estrogens in our body from binding to those receptors. So yes, is it a phytoestrogen? Technically yes, but it's so much of a phytoestrogen that it can actually protect the negative estrogen in our body from ever binding to that dock. It's like you have a proxy sitting, it's like you have someone else's boat is parked in your docking spot and you can't park there. But it's like a proxy where it serves no purpose. It's like a plastic plug that's there. So in some ways it can be beneficial. We've seen actually regression in some of these like high estrogenic conditions. So it can actually be beneficial. All that aside, there's also been interesting evidence where flaxseed oil can decrease C-reactive protein, inflammatory markers in obese people, but not in healthy weight people. It doesn't do anything in healthy weight people. So somewhere along the line, it's actually modulating inflammation for people that have a lot of adipose tissue. But again, drizzle it, do not cook with it. It is not designed to be cooked with. 
it has a decent amount of omega-3s in it, but I have to be honest with you, the omega-3s in seeds and nuts, it's a negligible amount. Now some honorable mentions in case you're wondering about some of these other ones. Olive oil is not a seed oil. That is a technically a different oil, a monounsaturated fat, doesn't count. It's great, have as much of it as you want. Okay, then we have macadamia nut oil, not a seed oil, coming from this nut, also very high monounsaturated fat, so it's much more stable, very low polyunsaturated fat content in that. Okay, what about avocado oil? Avocados are definitely, uh, you know, you have a seed in there. Is the avocado oil coming from the seed or is it coming from the fruit itself? Depends on who you ask. But avocado oil is also very high monounsaturated fat and relatively low polyunsaturated fat. So the concern with the instability is much less. Out of all the different nut and seed oils out there, I think avocado oil is probably the best nut seed oil alongside macadamia nut. So two very similar things. Avocado oil, okay for cooking. Macadamia, more of a drizzle. Olive oil, okay for cooking at low temp, also better for sort of a drizzle. So I hope that this recaps everything. And the ultimate takeaway, stay away from the corn oil, stay away from the canola oil as much as you can, watch the types of soybean oil you're consuming, limit the palm oil, okay, and watch for the unrefined versus refined. Okay, sesame oil is good to go. Safflower, sunflower oil in moderation are good to go. Flaxseed oil, good to go. Avocado oil, the best of the best. Olive oil, macadamia nut oil, right up there as well. I'll see you tomorrow.